the um, English power word of the day. is resurrection for those who are in the process of picking up the language. So, um, who's got, uh, can, can anybody give us a, how do you say this word in other languages? Who's got a different language? How do you, what is it? Okay. Which language is that? That's Cantonese. Cantonese, okay. Does anybody else have another? Francais? How do you say resurrection? How do you say resurrection in your language? Your son said Wuhai. Wuhai. That's not what I said. Oh. Wuhai. Huh? Wuhai. Wuhai. Okay. And, and that's in your first language? That's in, yes, Korean. Okay. <laughs> what about Spanish? Resurrección. Yes. A, a, a resurrection is when something or someone that was dead is brought back to life again. When something that was dead or someone that was dead is brought back to life for Christians, the resurrection is one of six central events in the life of Jesus. The first was the incarnation, right? When God became one of us, and that was the birth of Jesus. The second was the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Through it, he proved himself. And, and, and that opened up the way for his public ministry. And then the third was the death of Jesus when he allowed himself to be killed on a cross. The, and, and that became the sacrifice that, that reconciled people to God by wiping away the eternal consequence of all sin and all rebellion. And then the fourth, which is what we are today on, is, was the resurrection of Jesus where uh, Jesus overcame death, defeating Satan, and establishing a new creation order, an order which will eventually become the norm. In other words, um, Jesus at, at the resurrection made death obsolete. And so when you die, you're all participating in an obsolete ritual. The fifth was the ascension of Jesus when, when he returned to heavenly headquarters to to hang out with the Father and, and to continue His work of, of advocating for us. It was also the mark of the beginning of the mission work that was delegated to the church. And then the sixth event will be the restoration when Jesus returns to complete the act of recreating the creation and establishing permanent justice. So you can see that the resurrection is actually very important. It's a very critical event in the life of Jesus. And, and it is described from various angles, different angles, in all four of the Gospels. This is an event that's described in all four of the Gospels. And this morning we're looking at uh, the part, uh, a part of the account as it's described to us in the Gospel of, of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, we're in Mark 16, one to wait. When the Sabbath was over, that, that is on the third day after the execution of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, uh, bought spices so they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Three of the women who had been close to Jesus and, and who were a part of his band of followers decided that they were going to go spread spices over Jesus' dead body. That, that was a common uh, thing that grieving people would do, and, and because of the flow of events, they, they had not been able to complete such a ritual of love and devotion. Uh, and, and so here we are in, in verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? Now, at that time, it was, it was common for tombs to have a door. 
tombs had a door. Typically what happened was that after someone had died and, and if he was fortunate enough to be a, a part of a family that had resources, uh, they would put uh, that person's body in a tomb that was hewn or cut from a hillside. And, and the body would be laid out on a bench. It would be set out on a bench where, where it would deteriorate. And then a year later, the family would uh, re-enter the tomb, led by the oldest son, and, and they would gently gather up all of those bones, uh, and, and then they would put them in a special box called an ozer. And that was the official end of grieving, and they'd have this great time of rejoicing as the Osri was, was inserted into a vault or, or placed on a shelf inside of the tomb. Well, what all this means is that graves needed to have doors. And, and often large round stones were crafted for that purpose. And, and, and then there was a notch cut into the ground in front of the door, or the doorway, and, 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 the, and the stone door, as it was rolled in front of the tomb, uh, would slide partially into that notch. It would, it would set, it would just drop into the notch. And it would settle into place. It was, it was a fairly secure method for discouraging robbers and animals from entering the graves. But, but it was then no easy task to open one of those doors. There were no door knocks. And I suspect that it took several um, men with, with large levers to be able to open a grave at that point. So when the women went to Jesus' tomb to spice up his body, they knew that they would not be able to get into the tomb on their own. They knew that they could not do it without some help. And they had not planned for anyone to go with them that carried the lever and could pop that door open. I mean, they, they, they didn't have anyone to help them move the stone, but they went anyway. Uh, who, who knows what these ladies were thinking, other than that it would be, well, that it would all work out alright. And in spite of all that, they had, that had happened that day, or those past few days, they had retained their optimistic disposition. They were still optimists about facing life and, and taking on the challenges, and that they, they, they were not defeated. Verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And then, I love this parenthetical statement here at the end of verse 4. As a matter of fact, it's what's really captured my imagination this Easter. And it was a very large stone. And it was a very large stone. Yeah, of course it was a very large stone. I mean, which in, in many ways seems superfluous to the story, especially in light of what is about to be revealed, you, you kind of wonder, why is it that Mark included this little engineering comment in, in his text? <laughs> Under normal circumstances, the removal of a huge stone door such as this uh, would be considered a large miracle in and of itself. But here, it's just this kind of parenthetical comment compared to everything else that's going on in, in, in the story. Mark seems to enjoy being kind of subtle here by throwing these things in. And, and I would suggest that we best view this comment, and it was a very large stone, as being a giant exclamation mark that he's inserted in here to draw our attention to the magnitude of the drama that's occurring here. If this had been an email, it would have been accomplished, he would have accomplished the same thing by typing it in all caps and then probably highlighting it and making it large print. <laughs> the, the sentence here in Mark's account is the sign holder on the corner uh, who is dancing on the sidewalk with an oversized arrow pointing drivers to, to the huge sale at the store down the street. It, it functions in the same way as that guy that's, that's trying to get everybody's attention as they're going down the street. Look, this is a major clearance event. The big stone comment is screaming that there is a going out of business event in process. This is a huge blowout sale or blowout deal. 
Death is going out of business. The very large stone door that holds death in the ground has been rolled away. Don't miss this. Look inside. So verse 5, going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side. By the way, young man in, in white robe, uh, again, Mark is being uh, strategically subtle in describing him this way. This is code language for an angel. And these women respond in exactly the same way that every other person in the Bible who ever encounters an angel responds. The, the end of verse 5 it says, And they were startled. They were startled. Which is actually a kind, of, a, a kind way of saying that they wet their pants. And, and you can't blame them. I bet you would respond in exactly the same way. The door is gone. There, there is an angel sitting in the tomb where you expect to see the dead body of your best friend. Verse 6. But he said to them, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples, especially Peter, the dense one, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee you will see him there just as he told you. And at this point, these women were thinking, well, you're thinking that these women are going, wow, right? I mean, what if you'd been there? You'd go, wow, and, and, and that they're going to be flying high. And Isn't this great news, you know? And there's going to be dancing outside the graves. You know, they'll be dancing over all the graves. And, and, and they'll be singing, Christ the Lord has risen today, hallelujah. This is the best news ever. Now things can get back to normal. Or can they? Verse 8. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. <laughs> they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Sometimes good news is hard to swallow. Uh, I, I love the uh, Agnes Day cartoon for today. We've got it on the message guide as well. Ted the sheep asks, they don't say a word to anyone? Rick responds, you didn't know the sheep had names, did you? Rick responds, no, they're afraid. That's the way it is. All through Mark, Jesus acts and people are amazed and afraid. And then Ted nails it. He says, but you'd think that they'd get used to it. You'd think that they'd get used to it. But here's the point of it all. They don't. The marvelous acts of God can leave us dumbfounded once we start to process what's really happening in them. Or they can change the way that we deal with life. The, the Gospel of Mark uh, originally ended with, uh, at verse 8 with the women being afraid and, and saying nothing. That, that's the end of the Gospel of Mark originally. Uh, but the, the ending was so disconcerting to many people in the early church that, that when somebody came up with an alternative ending... The leaders of the early church agreed to tack it on there. That, that's how verses 9 through 20 became a part of the Gospel of Mark. But, but I kind of like the original ending best. It's kind of like a good sermon. It leaves you hanging. You're, not, you're sitting there going, okay, what did that really mean? But we know from all other sources that the women um, re eventually recovered from the shock and landed on their feet and became important witnesses of the resurrection, but but the original ending in Mark, as it, as it leaves us hanging, it is begging us to ask questions of ourselves. Is this rolled stone, empty tomb, angelic resurrection revelation going to leave us paralyzed, or are we going to do something else with the Easter message? Are we going to be like the guy on the street with the sign who is imitating the rolled stone? 
Are, are we going to be witnesses of the resurrection? Or are we going to be in shell shock? What, if anything, and, and this is what this story is begging us to ask of ourselves. What, if anything, are you going to do with the Easter message? What, if anything, are you going to do with the Easter message? 